Yo, Dietrich Labbers, what's poppin'? It's time to talk about electromagnetic free field quantization. That's right, we're gonna quantize the free electromagnetic field in this video. We're gonna start by postulating the Lagrangian density. We're going to try a naive attempt at quantizing them. We'll run into a problem immediately, and that is that there is no canonical conjugate for the zero component of the four vector potential. Well, I mean, technically it has one, but it's equal to zero, so the commutation relations can't possibly be satisfied. So then we specialize to the Coulomb gauge, which ultimately, if we set sensible boundary conditions, has the consequence of making phi equal to zero. So that solves that problem. The field that doesn't have a conjugate doesn't show up in the action. We're good to go, or we think. Then we postulate naive quantum commutators, and we find that they can't be correct because the divergence of one side is zero, but the divergence of the other is definitely not zero. It's inconsistent. So then we have to modify those relations in order to get the right one. We do that, we find commutators that actually work, and then we're off to the races. We apply the gauge condition to the equations of motion and get the equations of motion in that gauge. We find plane wave solutions to those equations of motion. We create a general solution by creating a general linear combination of those plane wave solutions. And then we invert that relation to get the Fourier coefficients in terms of the fields, and then we take the commutators, and then we evaluate the Hamiltonian and the momentum, and we construct all the states of the theory and so on, and it's all happy and fun. The significance here is that we're quantizing a gauge theory. So that means when we run into this problem with the canonical conjugate fields, we can solve it by fixing a gauge. In fact, it turns out that you encounter these types of problems a lot of times when you're quantizing a gauge theory. This problem really is a characteristic of gauge theories, and we can solve that problem using the fact that it's a gauge theory. Picking the Coulomb gauge and doing what we do in this video to quantize the electromagnetic field is just one way to solve it for the electromagnetic field case. So here is the math portion where I explain all the technical details. It's really fun. This entire calculation is done in natural units. The Lagrangian density for a free electromagnetic field is just this. It's very familiar, where F mu nu is the electromagnetic field strength tensor given by this formula in terms of the four-dimensional vector potential. Because A mu is a real vector field and there is no mass term, we are dealing with a massless spin one chargeless field theory. Remember that this has a gauge invariance, a U1 gauge invariance that looks like this. This gauge invariance will be important in a minute. We will try and quantize the theory as is. It turns out that very quickly we will run into problems. The first step of quantization in our first attempt here is of course to calculate the conjugate fields. So if we quickly do that, we've got one for each component of the vector potential, we arrive at this. But since f mu nu is an anti-symmetric tensor, if mu equals zero, then this whole thing equals zero. So then we have pi zero equals zero and pi i equals the electric field. Because pi zero equals zero, the canonical equal time commutation relations cannot possibly be satisfied here because they would demand that the commutator of phi with zero is some non-zero number, which is of course impossible. It must equal zero, even if you're upgrading to an operator. It turns out that one can solve this problem by breaking the gauge. There are many specific prescriptions for fixing this problem because there are many different ways of breaking the gauge. In this video, we will use the Coulomb gauge, where vector fields satisfying the Coulomb gauge are called transverse fields. Most importantly, the three vector potential. And of course we also have phi equals zero. Where phi equals zero follows from this if appropriate boundary conditions are adhered to. Namely, if one demands that phi vanishes at infinity, then del dot a equals zero implies that phi must equal zero. It is the fact that a naught equals phi equals zero that rescues the calculation when using the Coulomb gauge. Specifically, the vanishing of the conjugate field to phi no longer matters because we can ignore the equal time commutation relation of phi and pi zero, given that phi doesn't appear in the action at all in this gauge. Given that it's not there, we can just pretend that we never knew of such a field and quantize considering only the three fields and the three vector potential and their non-zero conjugates. In this gauge, one might want to try imposing these commutation relations. 
and these turn out to be just fine but these have a problem this is the second problem we're running into in an effort to quantize this field the problem is that if we take the divergence of this side and that side it zeroes on this side regardless of which field you're taking the divergence of because they're both divergenceless. In the case of this one, it's because the gauge says that it's divergenceless. In this case, it's just Gauss's law in free space. So regardless of which of these fields you're actually taking a divergence of, you have zero on this side, but not on this side, which absolutely makes no sense. It makes it inherently inconsistent. For example, if we take the divergence of both fields, then we get this relation here. And we know this has to be zero. But if we look over here, this applied to the delta function does not equal zero. However, if we fix this by inserting that there, and we apply the dels to both sides, these two terms end up being equivalent, and so they subtract to yield zero, so then both sides zero and we're fine. Now we can rewrite this like that, so what happens is we're rewriting the delta function here and then we're applying this operator to it and that just gives us this value. So the set of commutation relations that is physically sensible is this set here. Now if we look at the equations of motion they're this and then we can expand them out and take into account the gauge and ultimately we find that the equations of motion are just this. That means we can write plane wave solutions of this form that satisfy that equation where epsilon is the polarization vector. However, given that this is in the Coulomb gauge, this field must be transverse. So if we apply the divergence to this field, plugging in this value, we find that k dot epsilon equals zero. So we have this transversality condition. There are two linearly independent transverse polarizations. Therefore, there are two polarization possibilities for the field quanta, which as you probably already know are called photons basically two spin states. A subscript that can have two values will be added to the polarization vector to index this duplicity. For simplicity, the polarization vector is usually taken to be of unit norm, and they are usually taken to be orthogonal to each other. So then we can write the dot product simply as this chronic or delta. One can then write the general solution by constructing an arbitrary linear combination of these plane waves. And of course we also have these complex conjugate plane waves that are possible too. And for a completely general field we need to take linear combinations of both of them. And also we need to make sure that the Fourier coefficient on this one is the Hermitian conjugate of that one so that the field is real. Then we can calculate the conjugate field, it's simply the electric field, and we get this value here. Now we need to invert these relations. And in order to invert these relations, there are two integrals we need to evaluate. Now, I forgot to list the integrals up here, so I'm just going to scroll to the end where I have them listed, and then I'll go back and talk about the calculation. So these are the two integrals that we need to evaluate. And we'll find that they have this value, and that'll be useful in finding the inverse formulas. But first, we need to at least derive these results. So coming back up to the top here, in our effort to find those two integrals, the first thing we need to do is actually evaluate this integral. So if we plug in the value of this field and multiply this through and rework the exponents, we get this value for this integral. Now we can do the x integration using these formulas. We arrive at this value. We can then use these delta functions to do the k prime integral here. And the next step is to take the dot product of both sides with this polarization vector. If we do that, we arrive here, and then we can look back at that dot product relation we found for these polarization vectors. We find that they're just chronic or deltas, which allows us to do the lambda sum. So we find this result, and then we can drop the primes and get that value of the integral that we wanted, the one I showed you earlier, when I was showing you which integrals we needed to do. The second integral that we saw we needed to do was one involving pi i, the conjugate field. Similarly to above, in order to get the value of that desired integral, we actually need to calculate this one first. If we plug in the conjugate field, we arrive at this value. Again, we can use these relations to do the x integration. And we arrive here. And again, the delta functions allow us to do the k prime integration. Then again, we dot product both sides with the polarization vector and plug in the value for these polarization vector dot products. And we can do the lambda sum. And we arrive here. And we can drop the primes. And here we are. And now we've finally arrived back at that list that I used to show you which integrals we needed to find the values of. Now what we can do is we can take this sum of 
these two quantities, and we find that everything cancels out such that it just equals a of k. So we have this first inverted relation. Then we can just take the Hermitian conjugate of that to arrive at this formula for the other one. And now we can just directly commute them to complete the next step of the quantization procedure, and that is calculating the commutator of the Fourier coefficients. Because as you probably know if you're watching this video, the Fourier coefficients need to carry the operator character of the field operators because everything else is just a simple number in the formula for those operators. To shorten things up, I use this notation, even though for the most part throughout this I'm using non covariant notation given that the gauge makes for non-manifest Lorentz covariance, remembering of course that t equals t prime. And we can apply these two commutation relations to this value that we got just by plugging in the formulas for the Fourier coefficients that we found directly into the commutator. That gives us this value here. And of course we can use the value of the commutator of the field and its conjugate in order to complete the calculation. So plugging those values in and then remembering the transversality of the polarization, we arrive here. And we can use this formula again, and we arrive here. And now we can do the p integration. The p integration gives this delta function. And this delta function allows us to do the x prime integration, which gets us here. Then we can do the x integration to yield another delta function, and this is the commutation relation we were looking for. All other Fourier coefficient commutators vanish trivially. So then the complete set of them here is this, and we have what we're looking for. The next step is to calculate the Hamiltonian. By direct calculation, we find this value for the Hamiltonian. So if we remember the value of the fields and plug that in, we find this immediately. And then multiplying all that out gets us here. It's pretty messy. And I don't really like that word splits expressions on dot products. They're products. You shouldn't split things on products. I'd like it if they did it elsewhere. But for some reason, they treat dot products as though you can split them just like you can sums without making mathematicians annoyed. So then we can do the x integration. And of course, looking at the form of these exponentials, that just gives us a bunch of delta functions which you can see I've written out in excruciating detail, very long and messy. And now we can simplify a little bit and remember the properties of the delta function to simplify these phases, or in, in some cases when the exponent goes to zero, eliminate them entirely. That gives us this. And then of course I also recognize that there's a factor of two pi cubed on all of these terms, and I just canceled with one of the two pi cubed factors in the denominator from the integration measure, and that got me here. Now we can use the delta functions to do the k prime integration, which gives us this. Then we need to evaluate this quantity in order to get any farther. This formula is useful here. If we plug in the particular product we need to evaluate, we find this value. So now we can insert that, and we arrive here. Then we can simplify a little bit further by recognizing some cancellations. We find ourselves at this expression. Specifically, these terms with phase factors on them end up canceling amongst themselves. If we then combine like terms, we arrive here. We eliminate that factor of a half there, which is good, then I cancel one of the omegas against the omega in the denominator here, and I do the lambda prime sum, which gives us this, and we arrive at our final result for the Hamiltonian for the quantized free electromagnetic field in the Coulomb gauge. It's a very beautiful expression. Now we can do the momentum, remembering these values of the fields, and inserting them gets us to this expression. We can multiply all this out and get this mess, and then do the x integration again with the same formulas that we used to do the one for the Hamiltonian. Then, of course, we can simplify, cancel that factor of 2 pi cubed, and also remembering the properties of the delta functions allows us to simplify the phases. Now we can use the delta functions to do the k prime integration, just like in the Hamiltonian case, which gets us here. Then finally, we can split this up into two integrals. The first integral has an integrand that is odd in k, so it vanishes. Therefore, we arrive at this beautiful expression. Normal ordering gets us very close to the final answer. Then we can do this by breaking it into dot products. We get this value, plugging that in, and doing the lambda prime sum gives us this value for the momentum. Now we can verify that these two quantities do actually behave like creation and annihilation operators. If we postulate an energy eigenstate, we can use that to 
perform a calculation basically the same as in the real scalar field case, which gives this result. We apply the Hamiltonian, we mess with the commutation relations, we get this term here from the value of that commutator. This just allows us to do the integrations and the lambda prime sum to give us this term, and then this is just the Hamiltonian, so we have this. So then we can see that this has that energy eigenvalue, and then we arrive here. So we see that it is a lowering operator, and we can do an essentially identical calculation for this raising operator and we see that it in fact is a raising operator. The n subscript just refers to normal ordered. It's the normal ordered Hamiltonian. I use that notation in other videos. Now as usual, because the Hamiltonian is an integral over this product, its expectation values are necessarily non-negative. Therefore, we can make the normal argument that there must be a lowest state that is annihilated by a lambda of k, the lowering operator. The annihilation operator, and therefore that one can construct all of the states by applying creation operators to the vacuum state. One particle states can be written like this, and an arbitrary multiparticle state is given by this expression. Additionally, one can construct the usual number operators that behave in the normal way. This is the formula, and then, of course, the eigenvalues. The zero point on the energy scale is usually set such that the energy of the vacuum has the value zero as a consequence. We have this formula and this formula. This completes the quantization of the electromagnetic field. So now you have seen all the technical details associated with quantizing the free electromagnetic field in the Coulomb gauge. You've seen the problems we run into with the canonical conjugate fields. You've seen how we solved it by picking the Coulomb gauge. You have seen how we ran into a problem with the commutation relations and how we solved it by replacing the Dirac delta function with a slightly different thing that is sort of like a transverse Dirac delta function. Then you saw how we could perform the otherwise normal quantization procedure to get a very sensible, beautiful quantum system which consists of various numbers of photons being present in the vacuum at various different momenta. After you fix those two problems, it behaves like a perfectly normal free quantum field theory. The quantization goes exactly like you'd expect it to. So I hope this helped you understand quantum field theory better. I hope it made you love quantum field theory more. If it was helpful, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Dietrich out.